Welcome back. So today we're going to cover Bitcoin on balance sheets for companies. We're going to find out why companies would want to do this in the first place and also how different accounting standards treat the handling of Bitcoin on balance sheets. So strap in and let's get going. As an accountant and Bitcoiner, I've been intrigued about how MicroStrategy and other companies add massive amounts of Bitcoin to their balance sheets and how regulators and accounting standards boards respond to the treatment thereof. Today, we're going to cover some insights from Michael Saylor, former CEO and founder of MicroStrategy, and we're going to delve deeper into the guidelines provided by FASB, IFRS, and US GAAP. There's also an interesting rule from FASB regarding the write-down of Bitcoin, so stick around until the end to uncover the short-sighted rule they said and what's in the pipeline regarding future changes. We'll also touch upon the implications when companies sell their Bitcoin, which can trigger a taxable event. Let's dive right in. Now, Bitcoin, the digital asset that has taken the financial world by storm, has become a topic of interest in almost every conceivable circle, including accounting. Companies like MicroStrategy decided to adopt Bitcoin as their treasury reserve asset. Let's listen to Michael directly to hear why they decided to make this move. Uh, and I'm wondering how, how you came about that decision. Were you, were you thinking we've got a lot of cash because our business generates a lot of cash? So, you know, could it be treasuries or money market, straight up cash or Bitcoin? I mean, what was your thought process? Well, the story here is... Due to the rapid expansion of the monetary supply by the central banks, the cost of capital has tripled from 5% to 15% over the past year. And if we look out over the next four years, bond coupons and EPS growth rates are going to need to exceed that hurdle in order to preserve wealth. We had hundreds, 500 million worth of cash, but we knew we were going to generate an, another 500 million worth of cash. And we realized that if we held it in cash, it was going to debase by 10, 15% a year. And I didn't want to lose half of it. So what isn't so well understood is the BTC, Bitcoin is the best safe haven treasury reserve asset in the world right now. And it's engineered to be superior to gold in all aspects. So that, that being the case, a lot of people understand the asset story of Bitcoin. It's up 100% annually each year for the past decade, more or less. Mm -hmm. What they don't understand is that Bitcoin's a, it's a monetary network. And as a monetary network, it's capable of storing and channeling energy over time without power loss. Uh -huh. So we got really excited about this idea. And we saw it as a solution for the store of value problem not just for the $300 trillion of capital in the world, but for the 7.5 billion people right. on the planet. And so that, that's pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the tr uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Michael, but you know, cash on a balance sheet and, and wanting to preserve the power of that cash is one thing. Investing it in something that's speculative is another. I mean, are you, are you a software company or are you a Bitcoin hedge fund? at this point? I mean, why bother with the software part of the business if your belief truly is, is that Bitcoin is going to go up 100% every year, uh, you know, going forward? Well, first of all, we do have a software company generating cash, but if we simply swept the cash into fiat currency and allowed it to base at 15% a year, we'd be losing as much on the balance sheet as we generated from the P&L. So that didn't make sense. Um, on the other hand, the traditional concerns about Bitcoin have been that it might be hacked, it might be copied, it might be banned. And after a decade, it hasn't been hacked. No one's managed to copy it. It's not going to be banned. So although people look at it as being volatile, it's volatile maybe in the first decade. The next decade going forward, it doesn't look like it's going to be that volatile. It actually looks like it's emerging as the primary treasury reserve asset mm -hmm. for people that are looking for some way to avoid the great monetary inflation. Last quick question, Michael, and this is a simple, straightforward. Are you a software company or are you a Bitcoin fund? Our P&L is a software company, and we sell the world's best enterprise business intelligence software. Okay. Our okay. balance sheet is no longer invested in dollars. Our balance sheet is invested in BTC because we believe that's the best treasury reserve asset we could choose in the world. Now the big question, how has this worked out for MicroStrategy? Let's see and hear from the man himself. You were the first, the first CEO of a publicly listed company that put Bitcoin on the balance sheet. Was it a winning strategy? Yeah, it's worked out really, really well for us. Um, since we started, our enterprise market value has gone from about $600 million to more than $6 billion. 
So we've 10x the enterprise value of the company. Um, if we trace our, our performance back uh, to August of 2020 when we adopted a Bitcoin strategy, Bitcoin's been the number one performing asset of all the possible treasury assets. If you contrast it to the S&P index or NASDAQ or gold or silver or bonds, you couldn't have done better than to have selected uh, Bitcoin. And MicroStrategy's stock has actually outperformed Bitcoin as of just a few days ago. So I think Bitcoin was up like 140%, and uh, MicroStrategy is up a bit more than that. So I would say it's definitely been a winning treasury strategy. And maybe more to the point, our choice was we either sit in sovereign debt, we could have held a bunch of treasury bonds, and, and uh, they were yielding 1%, 2%, 0% for a while. Right now, the 30-year treasury bond is yielding 3.6%. We could have done that, but of course, um, that's not really compelling for public company investors. Nobody wants to invest in a company that's holding tons of cash or tons of treasury bonds because from their point of view, cash, cash is never going to outperform the S&P index, at least they don't expect it to. And they could own the they could own treasury bonds themselves. So by us adopting Bitcoin, we were able to tap into an asset which has been appreciating it in in excess of 50% for the past three years. And 50% is better than 3%. Well, there we have it. It's important to note that Michael still emphasizes that corporate should separate the profit and loss of their PL statement from their balance sheet when it comes to Bitcoin. Companies should still actively focus on their core operations for generating revenue, while their balance sheets can hold a diverse range of assets, including Bitcoin. So, how do accounting standards address the treatment of Bitcoin on corporate balance sheets? Various accounting frameworks provide guidance on the classification and measurement of Bitcoin. FASB, IFRS, and US GARP offer different perspectives on how companies should account for this digital asset. So in March 2019, the International Financial Reporting Interpretations Committee, or IFRA, because that was a mouthful, published an agenda decision addressing the accounting treatment of cryptocurrencies under the current IFRS framework. They concluded that crypto does not meet the definitions of cash, cash equivalents, or financial instruments. However, depending on the circumstances, crypto may be classified as either intangible assets or inventory under IFRS. This determination is based on the nature and characteristics of the cryptocurrencies. Under IFRS, if an entity holds crypto for sale in the ordinary course of business, they're treated as inventory and should be accounted for in accordance with IIS2 inventories. Typically, inventories are measured at the lower of cost or net realizable value. However, an exception is made for broker traders who buy or sell commodities, including crypto, for others or on their own account. In such cases, the inventories can be measured at fair value, less cost to sell, considering the intention to sell the crypto in the near future for a profit. In situations where cryptos are not held for sale in the ordinary course of business, they're classified as intangible assets under IFRS, under IAS 38, intangible assets. The selection of the appropriate measurement base depends on the existence of an active market for the crypto. An active market refers to a market where transactions occur with sufficient frequency and volume to provide pricing information. In such cases, the fair value of the crypto can be measured reliably. Think things such as Binance, CoinMarketCap, etc. However, if an active market does not exist, an entity would need to determine an appropriate valuation technique to measure the fair value of their cryptocurrency. Similarly, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, or FASB, issued a tentative decision in October 2022 that confirms the treatment of crypto assets under US GARP. According to this decision, crypto assets meeting a predefined scope should be classified as intangible assets and measured at fair value, irrespective of the holder's intention. Additionally, the movement in fair value should be presented in net income, and specific disclosure requirements are outlined for crypto assets. Remember that interesting rule that FASB set with regards to valuations? FASB's rule states that if the market value of Bitcoin decreases significantly, companies must adjust the value on their balance sheets to reflect this decrease. However, if the market value increases, they are not allowed to write it up. This rule has important implications for financial reporting. 
While it allows companies to acknowledge potential risks associated with Bitcoin's volatility, it restricts them from recognizing gains on their balance sheets if the market value of Bitcoin surges. Here's an example of this in action. So MicroStrategy actually booked an impairment loss of 197 million in quarter four on their Bitcoin holdings. Now this greatly reduced their taxes in this financial year. They were very adamant that they wanted the ability to write it up as well. And luckily with FASB's impending change, they and others will be able to do so. Another interesting angle is that some fund managers and companies are prohibited from earning Bitcoin on their balance sheets, mainly through their own investment mandates and corporate policies. However, many of these companies are able to hold stocks and ETFs, which is something Michael Saylor foresaw and offers a solution. Let's hear him in his own words. Because we plugged into, into Bitcoin, that meant that MicroStrategy as a stock serves as an institutional on-ramp for other investors. And if you're a hedge fund or you're an investor and you have billions of dollars and you have a mandate to invest in uh, securities, you can't buy Bitcoin even if you wanted to. You may not be able to per your mandate. And if you wanted to, it might take you six months to a year to set up the account. And then it's, uh, you're investing in a commodity. You know, and as you know, um, if I, bought, uh, if I bought a commodity on a crypto exchange, it would be challenging for me to figure out what the custody situation is. And I can't borrow money to buy it, and I can't borrow against it so easily. So if you're an institutional investor and you wanted uh, Bitcoin exposure, you could buy our stock. You could buy it on the NASDAQ through your broker dealer. You can uh, borrow against it. You can borrow to buy it. It's a security, not a commodity. And so what would be a 12 month, very, very difficult process and very expensive process becomes maybe a 12 minute or even a 120 second process. So it turned out that it worked out really well for us as a company, but also it created a compelling opportunity for all of our investors and it made us unique in the public company sphere. So yeah, been a big success. That wraps up our exploration of the accounting treatment of Bitcoin on balance sheets, including the intriguing FASB rule that allows for write downs, but not write ups. Luckily that one's up for a change. We also touched upon the tax implications when companies sell their Bitcoin holdings, potentially triggering capital gains tax. It's crucial for companies and financial professionals to understand these guidelines and tax implications to accurately represent their financial position. I've left some links in the description for the sources quoted if you want to read a little bit more in depth about the various accounting treatments. As always, stay tuned for more videos on personal finance and accounting. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share this video with your colleagues and your friends. Until next time.